Krishna Chaitana Prabhu Nithananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Shiva Siddhi Gaur Bhakti Vinda No, Krishna didn't let me go. Welcome everyone. We're just almost ready. Find it? <laughs> oh, you found it. Where was it? Thank you. We're just we're a little disorganized, but we're getting there. Oh, I can't use it because I'm in a. I don't actually don't need it because I have to put it in my pocket because I forgot the microphone. Anybody have a microphone on them that they don't need? Oh, I could use that microphone. Yeah, let's use that microphone. That'll be fun. This is stand. Move this. Excuse us, everyone. We're doing something innovative right now. We put this here. And then where does the cord go? To the... You need to pull it out. Give that to me. Data card. Sri Krishna Chaitanya Pavanitananda. Should wait to get out of Shivasari. Om Jnana Timirandasya Jnanam Jana Shalakaya Chaksuru Miritam Jena Tasmai Sri Gurave Namaha Sri Chaitanya Manubhishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Shayam Rupakadamayam Parati Shapadantikam Mukam karoti vachalam pangolangai te grim yat kripata maham bande sri guru dinatarinam. Now we can use the adapter. Because we changed our plan. Anyway, if you don't want to go back, we can use the batteries. Okay, we're getting ready, don't worry. Oh yeah, don't, don't bother him. Excuse me for being late. Actually, we can't make excuses. <laughs> that was the lesson of the last class. You can't make excuses. Um, there are a few things beyond my control, though. So, you know, excuses as you're beyond your control, you can make. So today I wanted to talk about uh, a definition that Prabhupada uses when talking about pretension. Pretension pretension means this is the um, pretension means who knows what pretension who knows what pretension means? Who can tell me what pretension means. Who knows what it means to pretend? Pretend pretending means to act. It's not really the way you are, but you act a certain way. That's called pretending. Right? Faking it. Faking it. So you're poor, but you dress like you're rich and you act like you're rich. That's pretending. You're one thing internally, or in your life you're one thing, but what you show to the world is something different. That's pretension, right? Like if we have a salary and pretend to be 
Yeah. Demon. It's called, um, it was, I think it was Bhaktivinoda Thakur who said, they pretend to be disciples, they wear dhoti, kurta, tilak, kuntimala, but they're disciples of Kali. Or someone may pretend to show symptoms of bhava when actually they don't have them. That's pretension. That's what it means to pretend. So, we want to consider how we are different in the way we show ourselves to the world and how we are. Or are we trying to impress people? Or are we just, there's a saying, I don't know if you have in Russia, what you see is what you get. You have that saying? What you see is what you get? You know what that means? Like it actually, what it looks like is what it is. Some things are, they're plastic, but they're painted to look like metal and gold. So it looks like metal, but it's plastic. So it's not what you see is what you get. It's what you think you see. It's not, you don't get what you're seeing because you think you're seeing metal. That's the idea. So let me read something and, and it'll help us understand. This is, I believe this is from the, I didn't write down where this is from. But it's from Chaitan, you can tell it's from Chaitanya Charitamrita. This is the verse. The Lord replied, I cannot tolerate seeing the face of a person who has accepted the renounced order of life, but who still talks intimately with a woman. This was the chastisement of Junior Haridas. And this chastisement was done as an example. It was about hypocrisy. He was a sannyasi and he was talking to a woman. Actually, she was an older woman and he really wasn't talking, he was begging. But Lord Chaitanya used it as an example. The sannyasi should not be speaking to women in a solitary place. So he's saying, I can't stand looking at your face. What did he say? <laughs> That's pretty heavy. Isn't it? I can't stand to tolerate looking at the face of a person who's dressed as a sannyasi, but who talks intimately with a woman. It's, so it's a pretension. He's pretending to be a sannyasi. I can't tolerate this. Purport. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur com comments that shara lata, this word shara lata, it's used in the verse and it means simplicity. And simplicity in this context means what you are externally is the same as what you are internally. That's what Prabhupada means by simplicity. As opposed to you could say simplicity in this sense is the antonym to duplicity, being that I'm different. My actions are different from who I am. Shara lata, or simplicity, is the first qualification of a Vaishnava. The first qualification of a Vaishnava is simplicity. Whereas duplicity or cunning behavior is a great offense against the principles of devotional service. Now that's a very heavy statement. Let's analyze this. Prabhupada's comparing simplicity with the opposite, which is what? Opposite of simplicity is what? What did Prabhupada say? Duplicity. What does duplicity mean? I say, one th I, say I love you, but tomorrow night I'm going to go to your house and steal everything. Or as Chanak upon it says, there's nectar on his lips and there's poison in his heart. I'm 
There's a saying in Bengal, or in Bengali, too much devotion is a sign of a thief. That means if somebody's too nice, then beware. They're going to try to cheat you. This person is too nice. There's something wrong. You ever have that experience? Somebody's too nice? And then you intuitively think something's wrong. They're too nice. They want to get something from me. So that's duplicity. They're planning to cheat you, and externally they're nice. And so the opposite, Prabhupada says here, the opposite is simplicity, which again means what you are is what you show. So you don't pretend to be something you're not. Or in the case that Prabhupada's using it, you don't advertise yourself as some great Vaishnava when in fact you have ten girlfriends at home. And your, your occupation is a bank robber. But on the weekend you go to the temple with beautiful tilak and saffron, nice turban, give the Bhagavatam class. Now you think I'm exaggerating, right? These things are more common than you think. There are many people that are habituated to illicit affairs, either intoxication or illicit sex, who, who are pujaris or who are authorities in other ways. We've, we've, it's always been that way and it's always going to be that way that you'll find people like that. And they don't have the guts to admit that they're not qualified for the job. That's duplicity. So they lead people on. So Bhagavatam says, don't become a mother, a father, an uncle, a guru, a teacher. An authority, a superior, unless you can play the part perfectly. That would be duplicity. I become your leader, but I'm not qualified. And I have to fake it to get your respect. So Prabhupada said, this is the first principle, simplicity. And simplicity would also mean humility. Because what's the definition of humility? Wouldn't humility be to not have a false pretense about who you are? Wouldn't that be? You could just, you could just be who you are and admit who you are and not have to show anybody that you're something you're not. Wouldn't that be humility? You agree? Yes? That a humble person would not be acting to get people's recognition? Right. So simplicity means not to be duplicitous and, it, and, and also not being duplicitous means being humble without pride. Okay, now listen to what Prabhupada says. The next thing he says is duplicity or cunning behavior. Who knows what cunning means? Cunning means of our English teacher. Using people. Without them knowing you're using them. Using people, taking advantage of people without them knowing to get something for yourself. Like Let's say you distribute a book. Person didn't want the book, but you're really nice. And you say, and you tell them, look, at, we're not selling the books, just take it. So they take the book, and then before they go away and say, well, we're just getting donations. And I'm like, okay, I'll give you something. And then you give them a dollar and say, well, actually, most people give about $10. And then say, okay, I'll give you a couple dollars. And say, well, just give me 10 and I'll give you change. And then they give you 10 and say, here, take five. Is that okay? And they might say, you're cunning. That was very cunning. You kind of went in like a needle, came out like a plow, and took advantage. That's cunning. So, Prabhupada compares duplicity with cunning. Cunning is dishonesty. So then you can say duplicity is dishonesty because you're not real about who you are. Now, 
We're going to talk more about this, but just to give you a highlight of coming attractions, I think it's actually a bigger problem, equally as big if not bigger, is the duplicity we have with ourself, that we sometimes convince ourself we're something we're not. We're almost, in a sense, more worried about us believing who we are than anybody else. Because if you don't believe I'm great, at least I can think I'm great, and I can just say, who cares about you? But if I don't think I'm great, then I'm destroyed. So sometimes we have a duplicity about ourselves, where we do something which isn't great, but we don't recognize we just did something that wasn't great. Sometimes we do something that's not great, and we think it was great. Yeah, I put him in his place. Actually, you didn't put him in his place, you just acted very inconsiderately. And you didn't control yourself. And you didn't deal with him properly. Or as we say in America, you acted like a jerk. You have the word for jerk in Russian? You know the word jerk? Idiot. Jerk, you know. Jerk? Is that, yeah. So, yeah. So that's also th something to consider, that we have a duplicity with ourselves to not be able to evaluate our own actions realistically and then think that we're better than we actually are. We think about ourselves in one way, but our actions may not verify the thinking. I'm great in this way, but you don't act that way. You understand? Yeah. So that's another kind of duplicity or cunning. We're doing it with ourselves. We're just not aware of it. Okay. So duplicity or cunning behavior is a great offense against the principles of devotional service. Why would it be an offense? Well, what's the principle of devotional service? It's service which is unmotivated. Isn't that the principle? Unmotivated service. And duplicity would mean you, you're trying to get something from your service. You're not being honest, you're not being pure, but you're being motivated. You're being duplicitous with the principles, acting outside the principle. Okay. Krishna consciousness means to be straightforward. Rupa Goswami Nectar Devotion says, be straightforward in ordinary dealings and be straightforward in everything. Shatovrite, be straightforward. Just as you are, that's how you should be. Be honest, straightforward, open. Cunning is like this. Right? Straight is like this. To protect them? To, pr to protect other people? No, in, in service you can be, your intentions can be innocent, but because you're um, uh, representing something or someone and there could be some duplicitousness in their motivation unbeknown to you, so we must be careful who we're actually serving well, if it's unknown to you, then how can you be careful? <laughs> well, that's what I mean. So, you know, like you might pick up a feeling that there's like... Um, well, if you... Um, I would say... One thing I can say is that if you associate with duplicitous people and it doesn't bother you, then something's wrong. Yes? Anyway, the, the um, yes. Sometimes in the name of being straightforward also, we might be downright rude to each other. Yeah. So where is the deficiency if you don't think? 
that's why um, speak the truth, but speak satyam, speak the truth, but priyam, speak it sweetly, if possible. It's generally more effective. Yeah, I don't think straightforward means to offend people. And generally, when Prabhupada's speaking about speaking about being straightforward, he's um, speaking about not showing off more than telling people what's wrong with them. I just want to be straightforward with you, and I think you're really a horrible person for doing this and that. That's that's not really what Prabhupada has taught us, right? Sometimes sometimes it's not, it doesn't mean you're not straightforward if you don't say something, because it may be inappropriate. And it may be wise not to say it. If you said a lie, that's different. If you don't say anything, that may not be considered a problem if it's in the interest of the situation. That it would just be an unnecessary disturbance right now for people to know this. Right? And, and just by knowing and negate the fact that you have a tendency. Because you're not. By you noticing and acknowledging that um, the, the situation, even if you don't speak it, then. At least you're, you're aware of the situation? Yeah. 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 So then you can say, when you make an excuse, then it may be that you're duplicitous, duplicitous because you're not recognizing the cause of a problem and you're pretending that someone else is the cause or some other situation is the cause when in fact you're the cause. That could be another example. That's another example. Okay. Listen to this. As one advances in Krishna consciousness, one must gradually become disgusted with material attachment. As one advances in Krishna consciousness, one must gradually become disgusted with material attachment. Raise your hand if you're disgusted with material attachment. Yeah. and thus become more and more attached to the service of the Lord if one is not factually detached from material activities but still proclaims himself advanced in devotional service he is cheating no one will be happy to see such behavior so then you might ask the question well as a young devotee, I may be asked to give a class. And I'm not a perfect example of what I'm teaching. Is that duplicity? Good question, isn't it? Because it sounds, in a sense, like it is, based on what Prabhupada said. You're tell just like before I came here, I ate 26 pieces of pizza. And now I'm going to give a class on austerity. That's not right. So the answer to this dilemma is that if you're a teacher, you have to live what you're teaching. Because that's where your power comes, from living it. And if you're not living it, in a sense, I mean, you could say by teaching that will help me live it, and that is also true. But a higher principle is live what you teach. And you're going to teach a lot of things, and so you want to live these things. And I think any of us who have to teach something that we don't live feel a little bit duplicitous. You agree? You agree? 
It's not a good feeling to teach something that you don't follow. You just feel like a hypocrite, right? So you can say in one sense to avoid pretension, whatever you teach, you live. Is that okay? Yeah. So Aditi saying, you may feel unqualified, but sometimes you'll have to give a class. It's 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 what you've been called to do, and you have to do. Um, I would just say that this principle. Oh, like I'll give you an example. Let's say they ask me to give class next week. So this week I read the verse, and the verse says, devotees only eat and sleep as much as they require, not one iota more, one, not one second more. And that's the gist of the, the purport. So what do I do that week? That week I make sure I don't eat or sleep one iota more than I need. Because at least I'll have the power to teach that verse. So that's one way of doing it. And I personally don't do that just so I won't be duplicitous. I do that so I'll have some Shakti to understand the verse. Because the more I live it, the more I'll understand it. So aside from the issue of duplicity, just as a service to the devotees to be able to explain something, the better you live it. Because then you can explain from your own experience. And that is realized knowledge. Right? Somebody needs to develop a handle for a stainless steel cup which doesn't get hot. Could be an elephant's head or something cool. Um, yeah, okay. Now, so another way you could answer your question is based on what Prabhupada says here. He said, if one is not detached but proclaims himself advanced, he's cheating. Now, you may give the class, and in the class you might say, this verse talks about not eating one iota more than you need. And I can honestly say I have no realization of that, but I have realiza realization of eating many iotas more than you do need, so that's what I'm going to talk about, how that affects you, because that's what I realize. So I'm not faking that I know what Prabhupada's talking about here in terms of this austerity of eating. I don't know because I don't do it but I know the opposite, and so I'm going to tell you how it will affect you if you eat and sleep too much, because that's what I do, and I can give you my realization. So at least you're being honest. So you're not being, in a sense, duplicitous to the verse, but it's your service now to speak, and you admit honestly that I, I don't have realization of what this verse is saying, but I have realization of what it's saying not to do. Is that okay? So you can do that, that's honest. Sometimes when you're giving class, you will speak from experience from the angle of Maya. Prabhupada's talking about Maya, you have experience of Maya, you'll speak from that. And you can admit it and honestly say, I'm speaking about my own experience. That's not duplicity, that's honest. But to talk about how important it is to eat less and all these austerities sometimes may be difficult if you don't do it. And if you give the impression that you do do it, then that's pretty bad. Right? 
And if you want people to believe that you do it and you don't, that's even double, doubly or triply bad. Excuse me. Okay. Okay, I'm going to read. Um, this is a purport to a song. And this is the purport to Jairada Madhava. So let's see what Prabhupada says. And Shato Vrite, dealing very straightforward. No diplomacy, no politics, no duplicity. That will not help. Shato Vrite, Vrite, his profession should be very straightforward. No underhand dealings. Shato Vrite and Sadhu Sangha. In the association of devotees, six things enthusiasm, patience, firm conviction, following the rules and regulations, dealing straightforward, no duplicity, and in association of devotees. If you can keep these six principles always in front, then you progress in Krishna consciousness. Then your progress in Krishna consciousness is sure. There's no doubt about it. So as far as possible, I've tried to train you, and you are doing nice. I'm satisfied, so keep the standard and go on. March forward, and Krishna will bless you. Hare Krishna. So, Prabhupada's bringing in another aspect here. He's bringing this into the realm of occupation. And so what is he saying here? Dealing is very straightforward. What does that mean, dealing is very straightforward? It means your dealings in the world, not just with devotees, but of course with devotees, your dealings in the world with people in general, they should be very straightforward. Then Prabhupada said, no diplomacy, no duplicity, no politics. So what's significant about this? The first thing we read was that duplicity, what do we say? Um, whoops, I skipped, I skipped something. Um, duplicity is a great offense. We just read, it's a great offense. Now Prabhupada's bringing it into um, practical dealings. No diplomacy, no poli politics, no duplicity in ordinary dealings. No underhand dealings. His profession should be very straightforward. So it's important, every, Prabhupada's making the point, it's important everywhere, everything we do. Interesting, isn't it? Yes. Right. Oh, you think that's duplicity because you're faking it? Oh, okay. That's an interesting point. If you're Krishna conscious, you're not pretending because that's your nature. And if you're materialistic, you're pre it's a pretension. Yeah, in a philosophical sense. But in a practical sense, it's different. So I wanted to address your point, which is really good. You don't feel like dancing. And Prabhupada says, dance anyway, even if you don't feel like dancing. And you can say, well, wait a minute, isn't that duplicitous? 
because I'm showing off that I'm dancing when actually I'm, I'm not feeling Krishna conscious. So it looks like I'm very Krishna conscious. Is that duplicitous? And the answer is maybe and maybe not. The point, the point that Prabhupada's making is, let's say you understand that you should do something, you're not doing it, so you do it. That in and of itself is not duplicitous. It's just when you think, look at me, I'm doing this. Look how Krishna conscious I am. That's the problem. Correct? Yeah. So, my guru says, dance even if you don't feel like dancing. So I dance. And while I'm dancing, I'm thinking, I wonder if everybody's looking at me thinking how advanced I am. And if they are, I'll dance even better. I'll dance more enthusiastically, and then I'll get more likes for my dancing. And then on my Facebook page, everyone will write in, say you were dancing so nicely. And then I'll feel satisfied. Yeah. So see, duplicity, it's about motive. So that becomes my motive. Duplicity is connected with pride because I'm doing something to get recognition. <clears throat> Correct? Yeah. Question? Yeah. Well, what, what does Prabhupada say? What's the difference between us and everyone else? The difference between us and everyone else is just one thing. Why? Why do we do what we do and why do they do what they do? Other than that, we're basically doing the same thing. Go on the internet and go on YouTube and just put dance in the search engine and you'll see people dancing. Everybody likes to dance. Put in singing, you'll see people singing. Put in classroom, you'll see people in classroom studying. Put in decora flower decorations, you'll people see making, making flower decorations. Put in business, you'll see people doing business. Construction, book publishing, they're doing the same thing. So it's just about intention. What's the difference between the mode of passion and the mode of goodness? It's the intention with which one acts. That's all. When we did, when we did Sankirtan, sometimes there would be other organizations occasionally collecting money and they would be more enthusiastic than us. Sometimes. And later we found out that this organization were recovering alcoholics and they were dressed up like priests. And they lived in a, a kind of shelter and they raised money for the shelter by collecting donations and they had a, like a priest shirt and collar and black pants. And you know why they were fired up? Who could guess why? Who would like to guess why they're so fired up to collect money? No? It's relating to, it relates to the money. Because they get a percentage of the collection. So the devotees would say, they're more fired up than we are. And said, yeah, because that money, they're getting portion of that money. So they're doing the same thing, collecting donations, we're collecting donations. The motive is different. Otherwise, the same.
not confused, but you know, like surprised. Yeah. Well, anyway, you, know, you know, if you have love for your guru, then you'll be more enthusiastic without 10%. Yeah. So that's there also. Yes. Well, the thing about that saying, the ends justifies the means, is that usually if the means aren't good, it, it, it may give you the end, but there may be repercussions. So you could say the ends justifies the means. As long as there's no repercussions and the means are somewhat pure. Because that could that could lead to quite speculative thinking. It's like, you know, and lead to um, sinful activities or illegal activities. Because it produces the right result. If the motive is good, usually the means will be good. Generally. And it's a. I think the problem is that if you think because my motive is pure I can do anything, then you'll get in trouble. Because you will end up, you could end up doing anything. Right? Well, I have a pure motive, I just want to do this for Krishna. Okay, so that pure motive now, I think, gives me a license to do the wrong thing because it's for Krishna. Now, philosophically, you could back that up. Because there was a conversation with Prabhupada about lying on book distribution. And Prabhupada said, you know, you're dealing with people who, who look at lying as bad. And so if you lie, that's not going to work. He said, but actually, Anything you say to get someone to take the Krishna consciousness, in the ultimate sense, is not a lie, because it's helping them. So Prabhupada said a devotee can never lie, because whatever a devotee does helps people become Krishna conscious. But now if you take that, then you think you have a license to lie and cheat, because it's going to help them. And therefore, as a devotee, I can't really lie and cheat. So even though when I'm lying and cheating, I'm really not, then that creates a problem. You've seen that problem before? Yeah. And then Prabhupada said, then he gave the example, you have to know how to catch a fish without getting caught. And that requires expertise. See, the, the heart of a pure devotee is so pure that that whatever ever he does is solely motivated to help people. So then Prabhupada gave the example, he said, just like a child is sick and he doesn't want to take his medicine. So you say, Tommy, take the medicine and I will give you a sweet ball. But if Tommy eats a sweet ball, he's going to get sicker. So mother's not going to give him a sweet ball, she's lying. Why is she lying? Because if he doesn't take the medicine, he's not going to get better. And Prabhupada said, of course she's not going to give the sweet bone. So if you tell someone, take this book, it'll grow hair on your head if you're bald. Take this, it'll repair your marriage. Take this, you know, in the ultimate sense, it'll do everything. But if somehow or other, you get them to read Prabhupada's books, you've done the ultimate good. So in that sense, you can't really lie because it's just, you just want it to benefit them. But unless that's done, held in the hands of the expert, it can be very problematic. Right? You've seen that problem? Anybody seen that problem? I think it's going on in the Middle East right now. You've probably noticed, right? Okay, you had something? Yeah, I was thinking, 
There's no, yeah. If there's no reason to say it, there's no benefit in saying it. The art of preaching is what to say and also what not to say. That's the art of communication. One of the problems we sometimes see is that we know so much and we're so anxious to give, give so much that when we talk to someone, our goal is to give them as much information as possible in the shortest period of time as possible. It's like, you just here, eat this, take this, and this, and this, and it says here and that, and Prabhupada said this, and Krishna does this, Gita says this, and, this. and you'll never see them again. And one of the, um, you know, that's, you know what that's like? It's like, Come, you're sitting out in front of a restaurant and you're giving out appetizers to get people in the restaurant and you give somebody 40 of those appetizers. So after they have 40, they don't have to go in the restaurant. So you've given them so much information, they don't need to come back to the temple. They know everything now. Okay, well, yeah, now I understand everything you teach. Thank you. And you never see them again. On the CD, why don't they put 85 songs? They put 9, 10, 12, 15 maximum. So they can put 15 on another CD and then it's business. I'm going to read one purport. This is from Madhya Lila 19, 159. There is a certain pattern of behavior prescribed for those actually trying to become perfect. In our Krishna consciousness movement, we advise our students not to eat meat, not to gamble, not to engage in illicit sex, and not to indulge in intoxication. People who indulge in these activities can never become perfect. Therefore, these regulative principles are for those interested in becoming, in becoming perfect and going back to Godhead, going back to Krishna Loka. No, going back to Godhead. Kuti nati, or diplomatic behavior, cannot satisfy the Atma. So what is, what is Prabhupada referring to as diplomatic behavior? He said someone who is posing as a devotee, posing, this is his definition, posing as an advanced devotee, but not following these principles and hiding the fact that they're not following. Kuti nati, or diplomatic behavior, cannot satisfy the atma, the soul. It cannot even satisfy the body or the mind. The culprit mind is always suspicious. Therefore, our dealings should always be straightforward and approved by Vedic authorities. If we treat people diplomatically or duplicitously, our spiritual advancement is obstructed. We had this really nice policy. It's a preaching policy. You're giving a lecture, you're on the street, someone asks you a question and you really don't know how to answer it. Your standard bhakti or bhaktin will feel, it, feel duty bound to answer it. 
and maybe give a very bad answer or I'll actually give a wrong answer. Yes? Can you relate to that? You want to give an answer. You don't want to appear stupid. And you give a bad answer. So seeing this, we were on a preaching program many years ago. It's a very successful program. And our policy is, if you don't know the answer or you can't give a good answer, say, I'd like to give you the answer, but I'm afraid that my answer will not be complete or deep enough. So I want to ask one of our senior people, and next week when you come back, I'll give you the answer. Now, the thought was, if we do that, we'll appear stupid. And people will, will not have trust or faith in us. The opposite is true. They think that's really good. You don't know the answer, and you're not going to try to bluff your way through. And you're going to find out someone who knows the answer. Um, recently, uh, a devotee in our movement, a senior devotee in sannyasi, had um, some difficulty. And he has disciples, and he explained to his disciples the difficulty. And the general feedback was that people appreciated the honesty. So I went online to see what the Ritviks are saying. And it was very interesting. The Ritviks used his, his difficulty to bounce off onto some other issue. And all they said about him was, well, at least he was honest. So people really appreciate honesty. You agree? Now here is a problem. As teachers, as I said, we're supposed to exemplify what we teach. And in Indian culture, where do the teachers sit? They sit above the people, don't they? And the people respect them. So in that culture, it's really difficult to say, actually, what I'm teaching you, I don't follow. It doesn't, it doesn't fall within the paradigm of that culture. But in the Western culture, if you say that, people think, oh, he's honest. He's also struggling, like me, with the same problem. They actually appreciate it. Have you seen that? Is that true in Russia? It's definitely true in America. Is it true in Russia? Is it your country? Your country? Your country? Oh, in England, definitely. In countries that have a duplicitous culture, then they would think, why would you ever do that? Because you'll lose respect. But in, in other cultures, they'll actually respect you more, or as much as if you fall, if you don't and you admit it. Isn't that interesting? Yes. Well, I think, I think, um, I think that's actually different. She's asking, what if someone wants to use me? You sense that somebody wants to use you. It's different than what Prabhupada's saying here. Because anytime you have to defend yourself, or anytime you have to maintain some stability in your life, then you have reason to protect yourself or to get protection from someone. So if someone's, Chanaka Pandit said, if somebody's dishonest, if someone's a cheater, <clears throat> you have to be a cheater to deal with them. So let's say, in this scenario, you know someone's envious of you. And if you were giving a class, and the class talked about something that you don't practice, and you would like to tell people, I also struggle with this, 
and I want to explain my struggles. But there's this person in the audience who you know will condemn you for giving class on a topic that you don't follow, <clears throat> then you just don't say that. Because you need, you want to protect yourself, you want to protect the audience, you want to help them. So that's not being duplicitous, that's just engaging the situation as best you can in Krishna's service. Right? Does that make sense? So, you're, you're looking at what's most advantageous for Krishna's service. The newspaper comes to your temple. And at your temple, there's been a lot of internal conflict. So then, he wants to inter interview you to understand what life in Krishna consciousness is like. And he asked you a question. He said, I would assume as spiritual people, you have a lot of respect for one another. And because of that respect, you get along better than people outside. Then you don't say, oh, here at our temple, we have so many problems. In fact, our temple president has got this huge ego and nobody can stand him. He's completely arrogant. And practically everyone's leaving the temple now. You don't say that. In fact, when Prabhupada was interviewed, sometimes they would say, well, how many temples do you have? How many devotees? And he'd say, we have 100 temples and 100 devotees in each temple and 10 cars in each temple. And we all knew we didn't have 100 devotees and certainly not 100 devotees in each temple. But Prabhupada wanted to impress upon them that the movement's expanding, or you could say Prabhupada saw the future, so we do have 100 temples, it's just going to be a few more years. So he wanted to give a certain impression, so he stretched things a little bit. That's not what Prabhupada's talking about here. That's not pretension. If you're having, if you're, let's say, a temple president, and you're having some difficulty, and a person having that difficulty shouldn't be the temple president. And you explain that to the devotees in your congregation that I'm having this challenge. Like I used to be an alcoholic and for the last six months every night I drink a glass of wine and I can't control it. And there I've tried to fight it off and I can't and therefore I need to resign because this isn't right. That's the right thing. People appreciate that. But if you go on you don't say anything. That's what Prabhupada, that's what he's referring to. And you continue to be honored by devotees as the temple president and serve. And every night you're drinking wine. That's what Prophet's talking about. And perhaps demanding <coughs> honor as an advanced devotee. That's what he's talking about. Or you're doing that and you, and you won't acknowledge it to yourself that there's something wrong. You rationalize it. Oh, it's just wine. I don't really get drunk. I just get relaxed. There's nothing really wrong with it. <coughs> Prabhupada said no intoxication and one glass of wine is not intoxicating me. So it's really not intoxication. That's a problem. Then you're not being real to yourself. You're being duplicitous to yourself. You're showing off to yourself. You're pretending to yourself. That we've, we've talked about this problem that sometimes um, a devotee takes a very exalted position, more exalted than he's qualified for. 
That means he was not honest with himself or pretending to himself that he was up here when he was actually down here. They have a saying in the, in the world of self-development, what are you pretending not to know? What are you pretending not to know? I'm pretending not to know that I'm actually not up here, I'm actually here. That's what I'm pretending not to know. Something like that, yes? Yes. <coughs> Prabhupada's asking some devotees to take sannyas, they're very young. And they want to fulfill his desire. I would say in most cases they wanted to be sannyasis also, in the majority of the cases. Okay, let's say that happens, but then the next problem, or even let's say this isn't, isn't a problem, the next problem is now that I have a dunda, it means I'm better than you. And I go strutting around the temple with my head in the air. That's the problem. Whenever you think you're better than the other devotees, that's the problem. Not, yeah, not that's a problem, that's the problem. And until we overcome this need to advertise and show ourselves as better, we're never going to go back to Krishna. Because Vaishnava, Vaishnavism means you see everyone better than yourself. And you're not trying to get honor from others. Because getting honor from others is a form of sense gratification. One of the high, it is so subtle. This is one of the highest forms of sense gratification available in the material world is honor. And if you're seeking honor from devotees, then you're seeking sense gratification from devotees. I may not be able to have gross sense gratification, so let me get subtle. Let me get the honor from everyone. Isn't that interesting? It's one of the highest and more, most subtle forms of sense gratification. And we don't even see it that way. How many of you ever thought that pride is sense gratification? Have you ever thought of that? Because she went to my humility class, right? Pride is sense gratification. Isn't that interesting? Others can appreciate it, and you can be happy, but as long as you understand that it's, it's by Guru and Krishna's mercy that you are able to do anything, then you're okay. It's because we want to be honored, we don't see that. That's the problem. When you overcome the desire to be honored, then you will always see it's not you, but it's mercy that's doing it. And then you're okay. Yes? Is it like a human need to be appreciated, respected, and loved? The human need to be respected, appreciated, and loved. Yes? So you're going to make a sign that says, Please appreciate, recognize, and love me. Or make a card and give it out to all the devotees. That would be an interesting idea. Probably uplift the consciousness of the movement. Um, that's true. 
And the first thing is, we should understand that in relation to other people. Like, she wants to be appreciated, she wants to be loved, she wants to be recognized, she wants to be honored, he wants to be honored. So we know that for others, and therefore we should do it for them. And it's true, it will inspire, it will make them feel... It will make them feel like they're worthy, that Krishna appreciates them. But for us, we're supposed to take it differently. Now, there is a difference between feeling some gratification when you're recognized and doing service with the motive to be recognized. Like, if I say, Laura, I really like the fact that you listen so well in class. She's going to feel good, and she shouldn't feel guilty for feeling good because it's human and it's normal. Right? You'll feel good. I feel good. And then she goes home, oh, so sinful. I was told I listened well in class and it just made me feel so good. There's something wrong with me. No, we shouldn't feel like that. But if she's sitting in class and, says, and she sits in the front and she pays really good attention and her whole reason is to get recognition and it's more important for her to get the recognition than to listen to the class, that's a problem. You see, you see the difference? Because it's natural, if we're glorified, we'll feel good. At the same time, if somebody glorifies you and you take it properly, you'll think, that's Guru Maharaja's mercy, it's Prabhupada's mercy. You take it in the proper way. So it doesn't go to your head. But you will be encouraged because being recognized is encouraging. It's encouraging that I've done something right and good, right? So it's not wrong to be encouraged by that. But if you start thinking, oh, there are 10 people, there are 15 people in this room right now, in Mahatma Prabhu, he pointed me out alone as the one who actually listens. That means I'm more Krishna conscious than everyone in the room. That's a problem. But if you just take it and say, thank you, I appreciate that, and feel inspired to listen more, that's good. Right? Yes? Laura listens very well. Yeah? Now, if you have low self-esteem, you'll get agitated. I listen well too, and he didn't recognize me. I don't like him. I'm not coming to his classes anymore. Right? So that's, that's part of the problem of what this need to be recognized does. It can create conflict. It can create depression when we don't get it. Why didn't he recognize me? I was listening also. In fact, I think I was listening. I saw that she was, you know, scratching her toes all the time. I didn't scratch my toes. And why didn't he recognize me? He doesn't like me, right? Nobody likes me. I'm not coming to class. I don't even know if I want to be a devotee anymore. So that's the problem you run into. Let's say tonight, my whole motive in giving this class was simply to get acknowledged and honored by you. So class ends. We all pack up. You all walk out. And not one of you says anything. I think, all useless bums. And then I make an announcement tomorrow morning, there's no class. I so I didn't get acknowledged. So what's the use? that's why I came to give the class, to get acknowledged. And now I'm not getting it, so I'm not giving class. I'm really upset. Why is Mahatma Prabhu so angry? I don't know why he's so angry. He's really agitated. He's really disturbed. So those are the kind of things that can happen when you're motivated by a desire to be honored. Expectation doesn't happen. Then you suffer. 
Right? You agree? Am I right or am I right? Okay. We have a question. Yeah, it is illusion. God's sibling is annoyed because the last time he went to the mandir, no one praised him by saying, oh, so beautiful you sing. So nice then. He never more went. <laughs> so it's a true story. He never more went there and he even now does not want to know about Krishna. Wow. I wasn't making that up. It actually happened. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> Hare Krishna. <laughs> wow. So it goes back to motive. Why am I giving the class? So everyone will love me. And if somebody hears this class and doesn't love me, then what do I think about them? They make some criticism. Then how do I feel? I'm giving this class to be loved. You're criticizing me. I want nothing to do with you. Now if I'm humble and someone makes a criticism, then I'll listen to it because I want to improve myself. So my motive is to give class to teach, not to be honored. And if someone doesn't like it, then I want to listen because I want everyone to get the most they can because my motive is to teach. So then I'll be able to listen to the criticism. Is that true? Yes? Okay. So we can call this class Don't Be a Pretender. Don't serve Krishna for recognition. Don't serve Krishna to show off that you're someone you're not. And as soon as you stop showing off, your stress levels will decline about 99%. Because if you want to impress others, you always have to act. You always have to look good, right? And, that, and that's very stressful. You have to look good and you're always concerned what people will think about you. It's a very stressful life. Where if you can just be yourself and be honest about it, it relieves the stress because there's no pretension. You don't have to show that you're something you're not. It makes life easier. You agree? So that's one of the great, one of the great side well, products of being humble is it relieves this need to be stressed out about what other people think of you. And then the other thing that point Prabhupada's making here is if you live a duplicitous life, you're always worried that someone's going to find out. And eventually, they always do. You were caught red-handed at midnight at night and someone just happened to be walking around lost, you couldn't find his way home. And there you were doing something you shouldn't be doing and he saw you. And then it goes all over the internet. I mean, you've been doing that all year and you never got caught, you've been hiding it. What kind of life is that? It's a difficult life. Yes? Why? Oh, you, if I'm honest, then I have to admit I'm an animal? Well, well, at least, as we were saying, if you're honest and you're, you're just an animal, at least don't occupy any position of authority or respect and don't get initiated. Because initiated, initiation is for human beings, not animals. So at least act accordingly to your position. Okay, we can stop here. Oh, we have another comment. What to do, husband doesn't let wife to be initiated. He himself is not initiated, but wife really wanted to be a devotee. 
If a wife is trying to be superior if husband, she's saying, her husband, it, if she gets initiated, would she be superior? What if husband le never lets it happen? What wife should do? Should wife showing off? <clears throat> showing off? Um, You have two things going on here. You have one, your relationship with your husband, and one, you have your relationship with Krishna. So, if your relationship, it sounds like what you're saying, if your relationship with Krishna gets better, it's going to get worse with your husband. And it doesn't. Um, generally, in situations like this, because I don't know all the details, but generally in situations like this, I advise that some man talk to your husband, who a man he respects, and see if he can work something out. Now, if, you know, if your husband's going to be initiate, ready for initiated, being initiated soon, within the next year, you can wait. If you don't think he's going to be ready for 10 years, then probably someone should talk to him and just explain it's not fair to hold you back, and his duty as a husband should be to support you. And it has to be someone he respects, because in many cases, it's very difficult or impossible for a woman to convince her husband of something. And vice versa sometimes. So if um, someone convinced him to be more supportive, that would be good. Or convinced him to get ready for initiation, that would be good. Or convinced him, or somehow they straightened things out. Um, someone else will have a better chance. But if you get initiation and he's really upset, that could make things even worse. Is that okay? We can stop. <laughs> Should we? Okay, the balance between where we're at and where we aspire. Well, Prabhupada explained that. He said. It's that same point. You aspire for something higher, but because you aspire for something higher, you don't think you're higher. Okay, I'm aspiring, I'm aspiring for something very high. And the illusion would be that because I'm aspiring, I think I'm better than everybody because my aspirations are higher. I think I'm better because my aspirations are better. I'm, or I'm following strictly certain practices that are followed by more advanced devotees, then the illusion is I think I'm more advanced because I'm doing the practice. That's what Prabhupada said. Follow, but don't imitate means you do the practices, but you don't think that by doing the practices I'm on the level of these great devotees and I can act like them. Hey, I'm going to do what Ramananda Roy did, and I'm going to have a bunch of girls that I teach to dance and dress them up and so on. You can't do that. So you follow, but you don't imitate. Imitation means you think you're on the level of the person you're following when you're not, or not even close. Right? So again, it's all about your attitude. It's all about your motive and attitude, much more than what you're doing. Okay? Now we're officially ending. Thank you very much. We'll see you tomorrow night. We'll take up where we left off. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai Gauda Gauda Premanandi.